Thanks, Almauk. It's always a pleasure to come here. So many young, bright people at CETA. And it keeps changing. Though some faces I see again and again, Oveli and Chris. <laughs> and, <laughs> and for you know, the people, young people here who look at you know, Chris and Oveli, my god, senior, great gods, etc. I knew Whaley when he was like you. He was a postdoc, okay? <laughs> Just like you. Bright young guy, you know, huge potential. Who knows where he was going? Well, he went a long way. Okay, good. So I'm going to talk about uh, numerical simulations of black hole accretion, kind of an, a recent interest of mine. And uh, I'll start by telling general things about accretion. Then I'll make the case that we need numerical simulations for at least some answers. And then I'll show you what we have found in a few cases. So to start off and get everybody kind of caught up on what we are talking about, we know that there are black holes in the universe. No doubt about it. There are these supermassive black holes in the nuclei of galaxies, typically one in each galaxy. They are supermassive, 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 10. The huge numbers of stellar mass black holes in each galaxy, maybe 10 to the 7, some people even say 10 to the 8 per galaxy. These, we typically see them as objects in the sky when they are accreting. So a supermassive black hole may get gas from the surroundings, goes into orbit, and as the gas spirals down to the center, it converts some of that potential energy into heat energy, which comes out as radiation, and we see it as a bright nuclear source. So these are AGN, quasars, blazars, Seiferts. And it's got a whole lot of names. In the case of the stellar mass guys, we see them when they happen to have a companion. And the companion is donating mass because it's in a close binary. Then you have the same uh, phenomenon. A disk, gas spirals in, gets hot, it radiates x-rays in this case. Both of these categories on occasion produce jets, relativistic jets. Material seems to be ejected, we think, perpendicular to the plane of the disk, and it can be relativistic, which means Lorentz factors of several, maybe even 10 in some cases, or 20. GRBs also, we think, are probably connected to black holes, though I don't think we have the absolute proof. But a large category of GRBs, the so-called long GRBs, it's believed are the result of the formation of one of these stellar mass black holes. So during the collapse, something happens, there's a disk or whatever. But the key point is there is this jet, a highly relativistic jet in this case, and that's what we observe. This is the fourth category, which is really a sub-case of the AGN phenomenon, and we talked about this at the lunch gathering today. These are the so-called tidal disruption events, and I'll say more about this as I go along. But basically, you have a supermassive black hole. Some star comes nearby, and it gets ripped apart. And the gas then collects around the supermassive black hole in some kind of a quasi-disk. Black hole eats that gas, becomes bright, shines. But this is a transient phenomenon. When it eats up all the gas, it goes back to some quiescent state. So this will be something that will last for months, maybe. A typical AGN, we think, lives for a much longer period of time. These are nice test cases for understanding some aspects of accretion. So I like this particular category, and I'll say more about it as I go along. Now, all of these categories, they all have jets, even the TDE. Some subset of TDEs, the so-called jetted TDEs, appear to have very powerful relativistic jets. And relativistic jets, of course, we have known about for a long, long time. In fact, before we even knew that there were black holes, we had seen relativistic jets in radio. So I've just got a few pictures here, famous objects like M87, which has got a jet. This is in the Virgo cluster, Cygnus A, the original radio source in the sky. With You can't probably see it in this light, but there is actually a jet leading from this central compact star to lobes, and you know, this is standard phenomenology. 3C273, the first quasar, was in fact first discovered as a radio object. It's a 3C source. It was in the 3C catalog. And so, you know, these are all objects with jets. And one thing to recognize is, in terms of accretion regime, they're not all in the same regime. 
So in the next slide, I'm going to introduce this concept of an Eddington mass accretion rate. So for each system, you can look at its mass accretion rate in units of the Eddington rate. This guy is extremely low M dot system. So the accretion rate for M87 is probably somewhere between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the minus 6 Eddington. I would guess 10 to the minus 5. This guy I don't know, but it's almost certainly greater than M87. And 3C273, I'm almost sure, is close to Eddington. Okay, so there are orders of magnitude difference. And they all produce these jets. And one of the things we have learned over the recent decades is things do change as you change the M dot mass accretion rate of a black hole. It's not like it's all one phenomenon and you're just turning the knob up or down, things get brighter or fainter. Actual physics changes and qualitatively there are changes as a function of M dot. And that's what this slide shows. So this is a theorist picture. Okay? So the vertical axis shows mass accretion rate in units of Eddington. And what I mean by M dot Eddington is the following. If a black hole accretes at this rate, so many grams per second as given by M dot Eddington, and if it converts, say, 10% of its rest mass energy into radiation, the luminosity that would come out would be the Eddington luminosity. So it's just a way to convert the Eddington luminosity to a mass accretion rate. OK, so I believe 3C273 is somewhere in this range of M dot. And what I'm showing in the horizontal axis is just the radius. So black hole is somewhere here, and I'm going further and further away from the black hole. Not very far. Even here, I'm only at 300 Schwarzschild radia. So I'm talking about everything very close to the black hole. Now, there is one mode of accretion that everybody is familiar with, the thin accretion disk, developed by Shakura and Sunyayev and others. As far as we can tell, this guy, for a black hole system, really only lives between one Eddington or maybe half Eddington and down to either 10 to the minus 2 or minus 3. You know, these are all fuzzy. Just have just drawn a schematic diagram here. But this mode of accretion is sort of limited in M dot. And M87, which I showed you, and I told you that that guy is minus 5 or minus 6 off the bottom of this plot, is in a different regime. It's a hot accretion flow. And I'm not going to say more about it. Just to kind of tell you that you know, this is something to keep in mind, the vast majority of black holes in the universe, they are all these starved black holes. They get very little gas, and they are all sitting down here. And they are not Shakura Sunya. They are hot accretion flows. And M87 out down there happily produces a jet. And while it's not the topic of my talk, let me tell you that the simulations, for instance, show, in fact, that these are systems that should produce jets quite often, and we even, I think, have an idea of how they produce jets. I'm going to talk about this regime up here. These are systems that are accreting even above Eddington, which is a very interesting regime and not easy to study, but now it's been opened up. And what I'm going to show you is that these guys can also produce jets, i.e., on the computer, you can make jets in this regime, and you don't have to work too hard. We sort of know what you need. This regime, I don't know the answer. I put a question mark here. Um, we don't have simulation data to, tell, to guide us. Observationally, there is some indication that at least the X-ray binaries have very weak jet activity when they go into this mode. So there could well be some uh, dichotomy of jet on or off based on regime. I can't tell you whether this works or not. I just want to put it there so that, again, something to keep in mind as we go along. So I'm confused because the uh, substantial star is in, in this region, in the bottom region. So Down here, 10 to the minus 8. So in this case, we should see a jet. As far as I know, there's no, no Yeah, I'm not saying you'll always have a jet. Oops. I'm just saying that you can have a jet. In fact, here, you have to work hard not to get a jet. But Sagittarius A star, it's true. I mean, there are people who still believe yes. that there is a jet. It's all hidden in this scatter broadening because you know it's a highly scatter broadened line of sight. So in the radio, you don't see the object itself. You see a big scattering halo. And uh, so maybe there's a little jet in there. This is the hope that people have. 
I personally think that it's probably not really a jet in that source. But yeah, that's not a problem. The question is, let us say some fraction of these guys can make jets, some fraction of these can make jet. Question is, what fraction of these guys will make jets? And there is some sense that maybe it's a smaller fraction here, but I won't swear to that, okay? And I'm waiting for additional uh, confirmation through some simulations or whatever. Okay, so let's uh, remind ourselves of the basic physics accretion. So in the simple model, the Shakura Sunyaya model, for instance, which is basically a, a thin disk of gas that's going round, each parcel of gas is essentially in a circular Keplerian orbit, and that means we know how various quantities scale as a function of radius. So the angular momentum per unit mass, specific angular momentum, goes like r to the half. So it increases outward, so it's less in the inside, greater on the outside. The binding energy, how tightly is it bound to my black hole relative to a particle at infinity, that guy goes like 1 over r. So I get more and more bound as I come down to the set. I'm starting with gas out here. It has to slowly migrate down to the center. So clearly, it has to lose angular momentum. And that's one of the you know, primary physics things that we have to understand to even understand accretion to start with. This is generally called viscosity. The idea is that uh, since there is differential rotation, there is some rubbing of streamlines that must be moving angular momentum outward. And this general term viscosity, I think now we have a pretty good handle on it. I'll show a little bit about that. This is the so-called MRI, or magnetorotational instability. It's all from magnetic fields. The binding energy also has to change. So this gas may start here. By the time it comes down to the center, it's much more tightly bound, which means it has lost energy in the process of going from there to here. And in the case of a disk like this, where did that energy go? That's what came out as radiation. Okay? So we see it as a bright source because it lost, the gas lost energy on the way down, and then it disappeared into the black hole. So this is something I'm sure all of you know about this. I'm not going to dwell too long. But this is a great breakthrough by Balbus and Hawley in 1991, who discovered or technically rediscovered this particular instability, which had been seen earlier, but nobody recognized its importance. It's called the magnetorotational instability. And the nature of this instability is the following. If I have a differentially rotating system, i.e. it's rotating and shearing, and I put some weak magnetic field, let us say perpendicular to this disk, very weak, tiny, it can be as small as you want, there is an intrinsic linear instability in the medium which causes the, the, the flow to be modified, the field lines to be bent and to grow, and the thing grows exponentially, ultimately it becomes nonlinear. What happens when it's nonlinear is not something you can answer through linear physics, but you can just do simulations. And this is a simulation from GAMI. The field was like this. Initially, it's very, very weak. You hardly see it. But spontaneously, your system goes into this turbulent mode, and you get all of these turbulent fluctuations. And the beautiful thing is these fluctuations behave like viscosity in the sense they move angular momentum from inside to outside in a disk. They dissipate and make energy. And everything that you think viscosity should do appears to be a direct consequence of this instability. So I would say, at least in the black hole game, and pretty much any disk which is magnetized and the magnetic field is coupled to the gas, i.e. ionized gas, MRI has to be present. It probably is the dominant viscosity. So we're going to take this as given. So we know how viscosity works. It's all magnetic fields. Now, there are analytic disk models. And these have usually been done by simplifying this viscosity in terms of something called the alpha parameter or alpha viscosity. I won't go into the details. It is OK. MRI tells us it's really magnetic fields, it's turbulence, some anisotropic turbulence, all of that stuff. But you can kind of lump it all into an alpha. And it'll do a fairly good job. And people have got a lot of insights by doing such models. They're typically 1D models, which means you're only looking at how properties 
vary as a function of radius. You assume axis symmetry. You forget about the vertical structure. Essentially, you integrate out the vertical structure and just look at things as a function of radius. So that's OK, except if you want to study jets, that's not going to be good enough, because a jet, you've got gas accreting like this, but you've got something else coming out in the other direction. It's indefinitely, it is not a 1D problem. It's a 2D or a 3D problem. So there we get kind of stuck trying to do purely analytic work. I would call it multi-D physics. And this is where the numerical simulations, I feel, have turned out to be rather powerful. It's a long history here. I would credit John Hawley with really kind of getting numerical simulations of such disk systems going. And this is a long time ago. Um, various others have contributed over the years, Charles Gammy, Jim Stone, and a whole lot of others. All these yellow people kind of were members of my group at various times. So in more recent times, since I've got more into this business, so I've got students who are doing all these simulations. And I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, what's going on in this field. One nice thing about numerical simulations, you can kind of add more physics, which may challenge you if you're doing analytically. There is a danger of putting too much physics in. Then you, know, you just get a mess of results and don't know what it means. So you have to be a somewhat uh, clever in how much you include and how much you ignore to start with. Most importantly, it will do automatically 2D, 3D. If you have a big enough computer, you can run everything in 3D for long periods of time. You can include magnetic fields and include them in the dynamics by using the MHD equations rather than fluid equations. So that's very nice. This means that automatically your simulation will have the MRI. So this viscosity, you don't have to put it in by hand and say ah, alpha and what is the value of alpha. This simulation will determine whatever alpha or whatever it wants through MRI. Of course, you can include general relativity. So if I'm studying black holes, I don't want to do Newtonian physics. I want to use the proper metric. That's something you can do pretty straightforwardly in numerics. It just takes more computer time. Just the equations look more cumbersome. There's many more computations, but nothing difficult in principle. Radiation. This is, in fact, kind of uh, the, the focus of my talk. This has been a hard problem. And until recently, people were not putting in radiation as a separate component in their simulations. And that is necessary. If you want to study bright disks, and especially super Eddington disks, they are making huge amounts of radiation. You've got to include the radiation. And so I will say, you know, what's going on there. But coming to the magnetic field, the magnetic field is needed in order to produce the viscosity naturally, um, spontaneously in your simulation. But it's also important for jets. Because I, for one, am getting more and more convinced that the magnetic field is the key for the most relativistic jets that we see. There may be some low power jets or winds that may happen even with, without strong influence of magnetic field. But relativistic jets, they require two ingredients, as far as I can tell. They require a kind of an organized magnetic field around the black hole. So right near the center, where the disk comes and meets the black hole, there's got to be a bundle of field lines. I will show a few pictures as I go along. And I need to have a spinning black hole. So for those of you who know the, the buzzword, I'm talking Blanford's Nyack. Okay? Blanford's Nyack said, give me a rotating black hole and a magnetic, uh, magnetized plasma around it. It will produce powerful outflows, I think that is the right story. That's how these relativistic jets are produced. And I'm going to show you a little bit of a, a couple of movies to give a little physical intuition how this thing whole, whole thing works. OK? So here is a movie. It's not yet started. And uh, somewhere here is a blue line. I don't know if you can see the blue line. But there is a blue line, believe me. Um, this is my black hole, OK? So this uh, filled region is the horizon of the black hole. Ah, maybe it's a little better. This guy is going to start moving in a second when I start the movie. So what I've got here is a black hole. It's a rotating black hole, but we'll come to the rotation in a bit. This is the horizon of the black hole. 
I'm initializing the system, not I, Semino, this is a science paper, never met this guy, but it's a nice, nice toy uh, model. So there is a field line that goes from minus infinity to plus infinity in this direction. The black hole is spinning around this axis. This field line is embedded in some charged plasma, or think of it as a conducting fluid. And when I start the movie, the gravity, and this is not, there's no angular momentum in this field line or the fluid. It's just sitting there with zero angular momentum. When I start the movie, the gravity of the black hole is going to pull everything in. And you will see this free line start moving. OK. So you can see what's happening. This guy is coming in. Everybody is kind of falling in towards the black hole. And OK, so far nothing very special. But it doesn't just fall in. Now watch what happens to this guy. It's coming to the front of the black hole. Then it's going to go around the back. And then it's going to go round and round and round. And what I want you to focus on is what the field line does out here. You see a kind of a helical spiral pattern, which is basically a wave. It's an alpha and wave, which is kind of just flowing away along the rotation axis of the black hole. In fact, you can go in there and you'll see that that wave is carrying away energy, it's carrying away angular momentum, et cetera. So I started with a straight field line with no angular momentum. Because of the spin of the black hole, this field line was spontaneously twisted up, and the twist produced the jet. Why did it twist? This is this so-called dragging of frames. If I have a rotating black hole, the space-time exterior to that black hole knows about the angular momentum, the whole metric knows that there is angular momentum and the whole space there wants to go around. That is the comfortable direction. If you put particles as well, the particles would want to go in this direction, not the other direction. That's really what dragging is doing. And this is an extreme example of dragging because we're inside the so-called ergosphere. So you said that everything is embedded in plasma, but wouldn't the same mechanism work in vacuum? Vacuum magnetic fields are different, you know, yeah. That is, I don't want to talk about vacuum. There are actually exact solution, walled solution. It's. Uh, so that's something that follows the matter. I would rather have conducting fluid follows matter. Then I think I know the answer. Yeah, because I'll tell you, vacuum. The field line actually would want to go away. It won't want to come into the black hole. So let's leave that aside. Okay, that's a, that's a that's a sticky business. Okay, so. This is good. So at least at elements, we can see what's going on. But it was very artificial, right? I just put one field line. Whoever, you know, why should I have a field line going from minus infinity to plus infinity? Accretion just doesn't do that. It will bring in field like this. But why would I get that geometry? So for that, I'm going to show you another movie. And this is a movie by Sasha Tchaikovsky. This is a full 3D GR MHD by which it means it's got GR in it, it's got magnetized gas, it doesn't have radiation. Okay? So short of that, it's got all the physics you want. It is accretion on a very rapidly spinning black hole, 0.99. So there's my black hole. I'm initializing the system with some big donut of gas, a torus, some big fellow like this, cross section. Okay, And think of it as axis symmetry. And in this... Uh, Huh, some resolution problem. There are magnetic field lines here. For some reason, they have disappeared on the screen. Uh, think of it as some weak magnetic field embedded in the torus. And when I start the movie, this weak magnetic field will become unstable through the MRI. It will start kinking. That kinking will then lead to angular momentum transport. This gas will start flowing in, because without this field, it won't fall in. It'll just be sitting here. It'll start falling in. It'll drag the field with it. And what I want you to notice is there is no magnetic field here, OK? There's no field line going from minus infinity to plus infinity. It's all clean. The field is going to come from the disk, and the disk is this confined torus. So assuming the field line is visible when I run the movie, just watch what happens to this field line once I get started. OK. OK, so it's actually kinking. You can probably see something is happening. 
things are falling in. This is actually this kinky field. Now watch what happens. This comes in, but because there is an outflow, it just carries the field line away. Then the next, next field line comes, it carries it away. So even though I had a confined field, spontaneously the system just develops a nicely organized magnetic field. All of these field lines are becoming parallel and combed together. They form a natural funnel. And you cannot see the third axis, but you should imagine every one of these guys is a helix. It's kind of going around because of the spin of the black hole, because that is there in this physics. And all of these uh, helical spinning magnetic field lines are carrying away energy. And in fact, this beautiful paper that Sasha wrote shows how much energy and angular momentum goes out. It's, it's humongous, okay? it's enormous energy in that relativistic jet. Oh. You have a little bit of material dribbling in, or yeah. something in. I mean, is, is that all sensitive to red scale or, or using Merkle fusion? I think what one can say is the following. Whatever magnetic flux comes in here, the code will conserve it, and it will keep it in this funnel. But how much comes in? depends on your initial conditions and how you've handled all of your physics in the disk. I'm sorry, but it's pretty much not the magnetic flux, but the material tied to it. Material tied small, to it. A small bit of disk material which manages to go out. Yes. It's very relevant to the GRD problem. It is very relevant, yeah. The details of the gas are sticky. So what I will say is the following. In this region, where you've brought in field lines, some of the material close to the black hole will actually fall into the black hole. Some of it further out will be pushed away. And in fact, if you left to it, you would actually think that the system would develop a vacuum out here. And the real system probably keeps producing new particles through some you know, gap breakdown or whatever. Think of pulsars, none of which is in this uh, simulation. The simulation, whenever it sees something going to vacuum, just puts some gas there. Because numerically, we cannot handle it. Yeah, you have, the, you, have you have a floor, floor. and so yeah, that finally determines. It's usually at something like 10 to the minus six or something. It's it's a it's a low floor, but it's not zero. Yeah. So yes. Um, so if anything else, I would imagine that the luminosity would be the magnetic field squared times c times the uh, area. Of the it's what it is. That's Blanford's Nyack formula. Yeah, with some nonlinear factors when you go to very large a over m because. One, then should be a whole unit, right? The yeah, yeah. Right, OK. So I got one more after this, which is just to show you that if you followed one of those field lines, it is the same helical pattern that I showed earlier. And it's all Blanford's Nyack. Some people may quibble, is it really Blanford's Nyack? I think it is Blanford's Nyack, as they visualized it. But of course, in a more realistic uh, simulation. OK, I'm going to talk about this regime now. So this regime, we know that there can be jets. At least we think there are jets. We also know that it's terribly radiation dominated. As you go up in m dot, these things are producing a lot of radiation. And you better include the radiation. Otherwise, you know, you're fooling yourself. Down here, life is very easy. There's very little radiation coming out. So you can do the kind of simulation I showed, where you just do dynamics, magnetic field, and you're done. But here you've got to include radiation. And if you go really off to uh, very, very large m dot, which is when you're getting into GRBs and, uh, and maybe supernovae and things like that, yes, then you're so optically thick that the radiation is just completely trapped. It's like just an, a fluid with some gamma you then have to start including neutrinos. So you'll come to a point where all of the physics I'm telling you will all get repeated, but now it will be neutrino transport, neutrino generation, neutrino escape, and stuff that you'll have to include. Very little has been done there, except analytically. But numerically, nobody has done that regime carefully. But you're right. Some other physics will come. But there will be a regime in between where neutrinos cannot be produced, and the photons are totally trapped by the opacity, then you don't need to worry. You just have to put the appropriate equation of state, and you're in business. 
Yes, thank you. OK. So now let me say, why would I think that this regime is even interesting? Because you know, we are all brought up to think Eddington limit. That's a limit. You can't go above that. And I'm here I am drawing a diagram with mass accretion rates greater, but we already had from this question. Look, we know supernovae are happily imploding and carrying all that gas down to the center. They are doing it at 10 to the 12 times the Eddington rate. How are they doing it? It's because Eddington is irrelevant. They just take everything and just fall into the center. So that already starts here. But this is a regime where we think maybe astrophysics has some use for this. And one of the uh, systems where it might matter is this tidal disruption event. So I'll come to that as I go along. There is reasons to think that these guys, at least in the early stages, must be collecting gas at tens of Eddington perhaps. OK, so let's see how to handle this regime. We need radiation. And people had not done radiation. You know, the whole uh, game of simulations, Hawley did his early work already in 1980s, OK? And until 19, 2010, still nobody had put radiation into any of these codes. And the thing is, radiation is hard. You have to think of radiation for this application, not the application you're thinking of, because there you don't need to handle the radiation separately. You think of it as one fluid. But here, if you want to include the radiative transfer and what escapes, etc., you need to think of it as two fluids, gas, magnetized gas, radiation. And these two fluids are talking to each other and moving with relative to each other. So you have to evolve separately these two fluids with lots of cross terms. When you do standard numerical simulations, this can be a problem. It will be a problem if the current condition, this very important condition that kind of hits all simulations, if this guy gives totally contrary indications for the two fluids. So current condition, I'm sure you all know about this. I've got some signal propagation speed in my medium. I don't want to use a time step too large because if my signal can propagate across several cells in one time step, all sorts of numerical instabilities come in. So to be numerically stable, I need to use a small enough time step so that signals don't go more than some fraction of a cell, not multiple cells. Okay? If I've got two fluids, and each of them has a completely different characteristic speed, like you know, radiation, it wants to go at the speed of light. Gas. It's got its own sound speed and flow speed and all that, which may be quite different. In fact, most of astrophysics, they are very different. Then, you know, you, what are you going to do with your code? If you include both, you need to be limited by the radiation. And then your gas is hardly moving because it's so slow. Nothing changes. Meanwhile, there's all sorts of numerical diffusion, and you get totally crazy answers. So the only solution is, I mean, there are techniques that can get over current conditions. These are called implicit techniques. I'm not aware of anyone who has put these techniques into a, a relativistic code. Even thinking about it, it's, you know, it's horrifying. So, and that's why nobody bothered to do this work. So, and of course, there is all this uh, radiative transfer, optically thick, thin, and all that good stuff. You want to be able to handle all that. It turns out people were worried for no reason at all. We are talking about black hole accretion. Look, everything is going at the speed of light, or close to the speed of light. I'm looking at, let us say, the inner 100 Schwarzschild radii. What is the speed of my gas? Maybe it's a tenth of the speed of light. What is the sound speed? What is the alpha wave speed? Everything is some decent fraction of the speed of light. And radiation goes at the speed of light. So the contrast between the gas velocities and the radiation velocities is not as extreme as people would have imagined if you're doing the ISM, for instance. That's a horrible problem. You must use implicit if you're going to do hydrodynamics. But here, in fact, you can do this so-called explicit scheme. You do need to slightly shorten your time step, but not too much. You don't lose a lot. You still need to do some implicit stuff. I won't go into any of those details, OK? But the point is, we are in the fortunate situation where we can handle these two fluids because their characteristic speeds are not all that different. So once you have reached that conclusion, then it's a question of how do you implement it? How do you make it work? Still requires a lot of thought. 
because there are these so-called closure conditions that you have to satisfy and you know how in what detail are you going to describe your uh, radiation uh, i'll just drop a, a buzz phrase here we use something called m1 closure at the end of the day basically it means in every cell in the grid you describe the radiation with four or maybe five numbers the four numbers are the energy density in radiation, and the three components of the flux, flux of radiation. So that's a three vector, that's a scalar in that cell. Of course, this is different in every cell, it changes with time. So you follow the evolution equations of all of these. I said sometimes it's five, in fact, all of our simulations, there's one more, which is the number of photons. So we try to keep some information about temperature and stuff, but that's a detail. There is this closure that you need, and M1 closure. I won't say more about that. That's what one uses. OK, it's not perfect. It's what we have now. It has been made to work. In fact, Oleg Sandowski, he wrote this code, Coral, when he came and joined my group. I think it's a fantastic breakthrough, because we can, now we can actually simulate these systems and get some answers to questions that people had for many years. McKinney also, I mean, same idea. In fact, we collaborated. So this is the, it's also Sandowski's work. And other people have included radiation in their own way over the years. So I'll show a simulation. This is one of Sandowski's early simulations. So what's different from the earlier simulations? Now you're going to see both gas and radiation. This side will show what the gas is doing. This side will show what the radiation is doing, some quantity, I think radiation flux or something. Once again, I'm going to start with the torus. So there is some torus here. It's got some weak magnetic field. It's also filled with radiation. It's a radiation dominated torus. I'll start the simulation. This will go turbulent, MRI. It will start accreting. You can see what the radiation is doing on this side. And it's actually quite a beautiful movie that Oleg made. So there it is. All of this accretion is happening because of MRI. I didn't show the magnetic field, but you can see. You can see all the, you know, see the turbulence? Look at all the turbulence that's happening there. This is all MRI. Material is kind of flowing in. Material is flowing out. There is a wind of some sort. There appears to be a more or less empty region in the middle here, except it's not truly empty. The floor will kick in here. But the radiation, you can see a hell of a lot of radiation is coming out here. So this system spontaneously will accrete. It's making a lot of radiation. Most of the radiation is actually getting trapped and falling into the black hole. But some of it does escape, partly through the wind and partly through diffusion. And a lot of it comes out along the poles. So this guy, I mean, you can easily visualize. It's going to be firstly a bright source because there's a lot of radiation. It's going to be especially bright if you look down the pole. And uh, OK, that's what you expect. This was a non-spinning black hole. Okay? And this was a 10 Eddington. And you can do, of course, any Eddington rate you want. And yeah, we have done many of those. And I'll give you some quick answers. How am I doing for time? Am I supposed to stop any time now? 10, 15 minutes. So when am I going to do TDEs? Maybe next time. OK, OK. But let me give you the first few answers. So here's the simple question that anybody would ask. How can you have super Eddington accretion? Well, we already talked about one reason why you can. You can trap the radiation and just pull it in with the gas. And that's what is happening in those simulations. And you can go to 1,000 Eddington and simulate. It will happily accrete. If you give enough gas, it will accrete at the rate that you insist. And all it's doing is it's taking the radiation, trapping it through opacity, and pulling it in. However, some radiation will escape, because there is some diffusion, and there is some extra push from the escaping radiation. And that's where you get this outflow. That's the easy direction for the gas. So, so some of it is escaping up there, partly as a slow wind, and partly as a more radiation-dominated funnel flow. OK, how luminous would these things appear, if I were to look at it? For most of the parameter space, the integrated luminosity, if I integrate over all directions, 
He said more than Eddington, but not by much. It's a few times Eddington. Okay, so there is some extra coming in the poles, more or less Eddington coming out on the sides. Overall, just a few Eddington, and this was suspected. People had expected this even years before the simulations. Also, as you can imagine, the apparent luminosity, if you happen to look down the barrel, can be much, much greater than Eddington because of the extra beaming and other effects that comes from the funnel. I'm going to show you that, in fact, there can be cases where even the integrated luminosity can be much greater than Eddington. And I'll come to that if there is time. Do they produce jets and winds? Yes, wind certainly. Winds always. You saw that case that had a wind. Real relativistic jets, I'll show you what it takes to make a relativistic jet in this super Eddington regime. So, uh, a lot of people are concerned about the growth of supermassive black holes because if, if you just assume Eddington that they can't grow fast enough, but if you say that you can exceed it, it seems like it's all, all the problem, right? Yeah, it's one of my slides. I see. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying I've solved it. I'm saying this is the natural explanation which others have said. I'm saying I would like to know what such a system would look like. And that we haven't yet solved, OK? So. Well, he solved it over a certain range of radius from the black hole. Absolutely. There's no issue about whether radiation can screw things up. Exactly. That's we'll, as far all I can say is if you supply the mass, the black hole will eat it. And Chris is saying, OK, I have shown that if I supply the mass at, let us say, 100 Schwarzschild radii, Will nature actually supply that mass there? Because it has to start from a large radius. This is an open question. I don't know how to answer that. So if somebody can tell me, look, early in the universe when the redshift was 15, there was so much gas and it had such and such properties, I have no problem. I'll give you all the gas you want close to the black hole. Then I will answer, then great. I can get super Eddington accretion. I can grow my black hole as quickly as I want. Making a 10 to the 9 solar mass black hole at redshift 6 is a piece of cake, right? But there is this gap. How do you get the gas from there to there? OK. How much of the gas is returned within this gap of 103? In fact, there is a lot being returned. So when I said that this system was at 10 Eddington, what I mean is this is 10 that actually went into the black hole. It really is trying to push much more than 10 Eddington from here, but a lot of it is kind of getting pushed back, and only the, the part that reaches the black hole for these conditions happen to be 10 Eddington. So the same problem that Chris is asking about. The further out you start, the more you have to supply, because you're going to keep losing stuff along the way. If you can make sure that enough reaches the black hole to accrete a 10 Eddington, then you can grow the black hole 10 times faster than people used to think. That's about all one can say. So I won't show that slide again, because we already discussed it. And anyway, there's no time. OK, so here is one case where nature probably is supplying the gas close to the black hole. Right? This is this TDE. So a star came in, came within maybe 10 or 20 Schwarzschild radii of the black hole, got ripped apart, then went back, and then it came back and kind of collects around the black hole. You have a situation where, quite naturally, you're taking a whole solar mass or maybe half a solar mass of gas, putting it more or less instantly close to the black hole. So we have taken care of this supply problem. right? This is the one case where I, we think you can actually supply stuff. And when you put simple numbers and you know, make uh, circular approximations, which I think I'll, but I do have my skin. <laughs> you're, not, you're not allowed to protest. <laughs> No protest. You make certain approximations. In fact, you expect it to be super Eddington. Chris is also there. He also knows that you may be ready to fight, but between us, we will control you. OK. Uh, <laughs> OK, so there are these TDEs, OK? Um, I'll just show some data. This is a garden variety TDE with maybe unusually good data. Um, it's basically an object that went bright and then declined with some power law decline in intensity or flux. Different bands all did the same thing. And it's believed that this was a case of one of these stars being disrupted. You dump stuff. But then you know, less and less gas comes back over a period of time. And then you know, the thing all dies off after some time. This is a, also a TDE, according to people. But this was a much more spectacular fellow. 
This is a swift source, J1644. This one had a peak luminosity in X-rays of something like 10 to the 48 ergs per second. And given that we think TDEs happen around black holes of 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7 at most solar masses, that is you know, orders of magnitude greater than Eddington. So for some reason, this guy produced a huge, maybe 1,000 or 10,000 Eddington luminosity, and in X-rays, which is you know, unusual. AGN shine in UV, right? If this is like an AGN, it produced it all in X-ray. In fact, optical and UV was not that bright. OK, but we think this is also a TD. So let me you said I should stop at 3, right? OK. Soft limited. Soft limited. OK, yeah, I can exceed it you know, <laughs> by a factor of 1,000. No problem, OK. <laughs> So here is this classic paper by Rees, 1988, where he first kind of put the basic elements of what a TDE is. Star comes in, gets ripped apart, and now the different pieces are doing their own thing. So each goes off in a more or less ballistic orbit. Roughly half the star remains bound to the black hole and goes and comes back. It's on an elliptical orbit. And the other half just escapes off to infinity. The key point here is that these are all highly elliptical orbits. And the point about elliptical orbits is an elliptical orbit compared to a circular orbit has low angular momentum, but also low binding energy. Right? The binding energy is pretty much given by how far out it goes here before coming back. And here is Reese's number, which is kind of roughly right. It's probably a little bit less than that. And it's got low angular momentum because it's this highly eccentric orbit. And so this material, it can't just naturally come back and make a good circular orbit. It's not so easy. It has low angular momentum, which means the material wants to be at small radius. But it's weakly bound. And the binding energy says it wants to be at a large radius. So it has to do something. Almog will tell you what it does is it never makes a disk at all. Or at least I think it's what he was trying to say. However, OK. I'm going to say, look, let us suppose it does make a disk, and I'll show you one movie where it did make a disk, a very simple-minded movie that, uh, not a movie, I'm sorry, Sandowski's paper. So he just did a simple simulation of the stream of material coming back, going into orbit around the black hole. And essentially what you find is that this system for the particular geometry he assumed becomes a big puffy disk. So this is the rotation axis of the disk. The material is in orbit around this black hole. It has low angular momentum, because that was the nature of my initial conditions. So it's actually, the angular momentum is determined more or less by the inner edge of this disk. But it's puffed up. Why is it puffed up? Because it has low binding energy. So it just wants to become a big, floppy, more or less spherical system. So if you took those boundary conditions and said, I want a spherical system with these boundary conditions, there's the, you, know, you can actually solve it analytically. You can get a nice uh, torus-like condition. And at least in this simulation, it looks like it forms something like a big, fat torus. This did not include radiation. In fact, this did not even include magnetic fields. He did magnetic fields later. But I'm going to just take this as my guiding principle. And I'm going to simulate, assuming that I've already formed this torus. And that is what my student, Brandon Kurt, did. So he started with a big, fat torus. It had the right amount of angular momentum. It had the right amount of binding energy, very low binding energy, low angular momentum. So circularization is close to the black hole, huge puffy object. Accreting at 50 Eddington, he thought that was a good number. 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole. And essentially, you know, you take this guy and run it with your radiation GR code and see what it does. It's going to create, it's going to have winds, it's going to have this and that. Question is, what are all these this and that? Two more parameters. It's not just enough to know M and M dot. There are two more parameters you need to worry about. Going back to my jet discussion, black hole spin. We think it's relevant. So he did two choices of spin, 0 and 0.9. You also have to decide what is the magnetic field strength. How much flux of magnetic field do you have 
around the black hole. And so he tuned his uh, conditions such that we could either get a weak field or a strong field. And let's not worry about the names. The strong field corresponds to a particular limit. It's called the mad limit, magnetically arrested disk. And the sane is the opposite, OK? So sane means weak field. Mad means strong field. OK, so this movie shows a kind of a zoomed up view of this simulation, or two of the simulations that Brandon did. Off on the left is the case of a non-spinning black hole and a weak field, same. Gas density here, radiation here. Off on the right is a spinning black hole and a strong field, mad, OK? Gas density here, radiation here. Ignore this little black region. That is, it was simulated, but we don't believe the answer, so we just cut it out. The rest of it is probably OK. So as far as the gas dynamics goes, you don't see too much difference in the overall structure. The only difference you can notice is that there is much more radiation coming out in this mad spinning guy compared to the other guy. But overall, it doesn't look like there's a huge difference between these two simulations. Incidentally, they were given identical initial conditions. Okay? The only difference is what was the magnetic field accumulation and the spin of the black hole. When you say strongly magnetized, how would that compare with uh, magnetic field of the star? It's a big problem for the TDEs because the realistic field in a star is not enough to make it mad. And I know that Sasha worried about this. And in fact, uh, I also worried about it with another student. And I can say, at the moment, we don't have a good picture of how that field gets there. Maybe there is a dynamo that somehow builds up the field. It's an open question. But it hasn't really been computed long enough to, to Yeah, yeah. No, I wouldn't trust the simulation. Where the dynamo happens. Yeah. There is some interesting work recently that Sasha has done with Matthew Liska, where he says there is actually a possibility of dynamo. Let's just say that's an open question. This is an experiment. We just put it in, and let's see what happens. So, yeah? This is density. You're seeing that? Good. You have good eyes. You'll see more of it in the next slide, OK, if this fellow will come. Oh, it says cancel. Okay. I don't know why this guy does this. OK, it's the same movie, OK? But I'm now going out to a few thousand Schwarzschild radii so that I can see the outflow in more detail. And this is the part that you were asking about. Right? We saw the innermost region. What is that? This color shows the Lorentz factor of the material that is escaping from this system. OK? It's a color scheme where yellow, Bright yellow would be a Lorentz factor of 5. This reddish would be Lorentz factor of 3. Orange would be 4, 5, etc. And what you see is this half, this mad 0.9 guy, happily makes truly relativistic escaping fluid. But it seems like the, the Lorentz factor is oscillating. So you have fast, you alternate between fast and low with fast and slow. It is going blobby, yeah. That's a different matter. Do you, have, do you get like internal collisions with that? Could be. I can't say that it actually happens and does anything to the radiation. We don't have the resolution. This guy has nothing. In fact, the fastest material is maybe 0.7 C. So I mean, it's, it's semi-relativistic, but it's not a jet. This guy is a jet. So here is a clear case where you can get a jet with this guy, strong spin, strong field, and nothing doing with this other guy. What else can you say? OK, you've got a simulation. So you know you can see it's now becoming pretty bright and yellow. But it's blobby, true. But you can get very high uh, Lorentz factor stuff. You can go and observe the simulation. right? This is just simulation in simulation uh, coordinates. Now you can pretend to be an observer, look at it, and ask, what kind of spectrum will I see? Good, we can calculate that. So here are the spectra. The guy on the left. That's the boring guy, right? Weak field, no rotation. Gives a kind of an AGN-like spectrum. Peak in, the, in EUV, more or less. 
luminosity is about you know, slightly below Eddington. The different lines correspond to different viewing angles. 10 degrees means you're looking almost face on. 90 degrees means edge on. The edge on is all just UV. There's some X-ray. So this is all X-ray band. That's interesting. There is this component that is much stronger when I look at 10 degrees. But overall, there's nothing very special about this fellow. This fellow, on the other hand, this is the spinning guy with strong field. Look at that spectrum. This is Eddington for this black hole. Man, this guy is over Eddington, over five orders of magnitude in frequency, whichever direction you view. And if you happen to be looking down the axis, God help us, it's all 10 to the 48 arcs per second in X-rays, OK? Pretty much like this Swift JA 1644 object. In fact, the spectrum is surprisingly like it. And all you're doing is you're running a simulation and just looking at what radiation comes out. OK, so this is one case where I believe the integrated luminosity, integrated over all angles, is itself well over 10 Eddington. OK, maybe it's 20 Eddington. This fellow is just maybe two or three Eddington. So here is a truly super Eddington luminous object. And it's all coming from the jet. And the jet, even though I'm not going to show you, is ultimately, you know, we can't prove it. It's really being powered by the spin of the black hole, Blanford's Nyack, and all of that stuff. This is Comptonized UV, Comptonized, I think, both by the bulk motion, but also it is hot. It's thermal Comptonization. So that's what this is all about. Yeah. People have asked me, can you follow photons and say, where is the Comptonization happening? Our tools are not quite designed for that, but I want to look into it. But it is Comptonization. Just to get a little better picture, of what these guys might look like if you could actually look at them, if you could make an image. This guy, if I were to look at it from 90 degrees, in optical, I will just see this fluffy torus. I see just the photosphere of the torus. Little bit sticking out, that's the jet. If I look in x-rays, of course, the torus is too cool. It doesn't produce any x-rays. The only x-rays are coming from where the jet is sticking out. And not much of a jet. This guy's just got a wimpy jet. But the little bit that sticks out, makes x-rays, whereas if I look at the other guy, the jetted guy, wow, I get a huge amount of uh, jet emission. In fact, all of this x-rays, which is visible even at 90 degrees, is all coming from scattering and other stuff from the jet. And if I look face on, it becomes incredibly bright. Let's not dwell on this, OK? But uh, let me just say, based on just the running simulation, we ran four simulations, two spins, two field strengths, four simulations. Three of them produced essentially no jet, produced boring spectra. The spectra are not very different from this, pretty much for all three cases. And the fourth box produced systems like this. So in the space of uh, two by two matrix, this is where your swift source would live. It will produce jetted stuff, and especially if you're face on, huge luminosities. And these are probably the rest of the TDEs. Many open questions. Chris already asked, how do you bring all that magnetic field down here? It's an open question. Will the system ever become mad? Our simulations say, if you're mad, you can make Swift J1644. Otherwise, it's going to be very hard. So we have to figure out how it does it. Which one? M dots are all at around 50. All at 50 Eddington. Yeah. 50 is why. I mean, they've used the identical initial conditions. So this is supposed to be early in the life of the TDE. Then it's declining. OK? But this is the early phase, which we think we can simulate using our code. Yeah. Since we don't see the other chips from all, from all uh, trees, it could be that most of them have happened in one of the other trees. Uh, Absolutely. I think so, yeah. So we don't know how to predict what fraction will be here. Because that finally comes down to this. How often can you make a mad field? And how often do you get a spinning black hole, really rapidly spinning black hole? We already talked about this, early growth of supermassive black holes. I think this is a natural way to do it through super Eddington accretion if you can get the gas down to the center, if there is enough gas supply. Okay. Uh, 
I wanted to say something about quasars, but let me not say that. Let me stop here with a summary. So what I like about disk simulations is that it's kind of a first principles approach where you can put in the parts of the physics that you think are important without too many adjustable knobs. There's still the knob with the magnetic field strength. And that turns out to be an important knob, but mostly the rest of it is taken care of by the simulation. We are understanding some parts of the problem. The dynamics is getting under control. We think we are getting some idea of jets. We can do thermal radiation. We can do super Eddington accretion. We cannot do non-thermal physics. That's bad because a lot of our observations are non-thermal. We really cannot do quasars, and I wish we could, but we are not yet ready to tackle quasars. I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't do analytic work. I'm saying that this is another way to understand particularly complicated multidimensional problems. Simulations can give some insights. So let me stop there. Thank you. physics is not at all included in the simulations. So we do not have fair production. But you know how many uh, happen in the photons. Yes, that's right. But the thing is, once you put pair production, it will damp the spectrum down below that limit. And then you have to do it self-consistently to see yeah. if it will keep producing pairs. But more interestingly, there could be pair production right in the jet itself in that stagnation zone. Remember in your earlier question I said, some material flows out, some falls in, there's that gap. That gap is probably making pairs. Perhaps from photons, X-ray photons, I don't know how it makes it, but those pairs will then flow out. So yes, these systems but, could, but yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, so I think in principle it's possible. What this enormous radiation field will do, I don't know. Okay, remember this funnel is absolutely chock full of radiation coming in from all around. So, any more questions? So I have one question. So I'm wondering about the energetic that's coming out of the. Uh, so you talked about the F radiation, but from Swift you also have radium. And the one you, and one of the uncertainties about trying to infer the density of, of the gas around the black hole is the opening angle of, of, the, of the jet. So is this something that you can reliably, reliably get from your simulation? Reliably, I don't know. What we do know is generally from experience, us and many other groups, when you are mad, your funnel tends to be more open. Just that extra magnetic pressure keeps it more open. And when you're not mad, you're in the same regime, you're a narrower funnel. But beyond that, it's hard to say. And you know, the radio really is not coming from the system I am simulating, it's from this outflow then going and doing some stuff which is outside the range of these simulations. So are you saying that from observations you have some constraint on the angle? No, I'm saying that one of the uncertainties when you try to operate, what you want to get to is the density of the gas around the black hole. Yeah. So you see the synchrotron, but one of the uncertainties is, is what, what would be the, well, the, the Lorentz factor and the opening angle of yeah. the jet. So I'm wondering if, you, if there's a way to get this information Good. from no simulation. Good. I, I mean, I can get you a number, but yeah. what you really want to know is what would it depend on, let us say, m dot, or these parameters, you know, how big the torus is, the binding right. energy. One could probably look into that. It's an interesting question, yeah. It's worth, worth thinking about, yeah. Okay. <laughs>